Now, I did say that, you know, today is Miracle Sunday, and I've said this before, but it probably bears repeating. Everything about Jesus was miraculous. His conception, his birth, his, uh, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So everything about Jesus was miraculous. So miracles should not be strangers to believers, amen, because the same God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of us. So we should expect God to do things. Jesus said in, in, in Matthew, uh, or Hebrews 13, he said, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing today, but he's using us as instruments of righteousness to be his feet, his hands, his mouthpiece upon the earth. So we, we want to we do, do the works of Jesus. But in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, is our, uh, uh, our, our theme scripture, scripture for this series on, on the fruit of the Spirit. It says, is that the right one? Well, yeah, that's that wasn't the one I thought. Did I? No, it's supposed to be maybe up. It's supposed to be Galatians 5:22. Did I put down Ephesians? Well, anyhow, we know what Ephesians 5:22. I'm sorry, but let me let me let me let me read that here just a second. Well, that's not a bad scripture either. Oh, bless God, <laughs> right, Miss Marble? Oh, praise God. <laughs> but but Galatians, Galatians. I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes we we hit the wrong keys on the, on the keyboard. And, on, uh, so that's, that's probably my error. But anyhow, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And that's what we're talking about today is faithfulness. And then verse 23 says, Gentleness, self-control, against such there is, there is no law. So we're talking about faithfulness. Now, we've, we've discussed the characteristics of the Spirit, which is called fruit. It says, these are the fruits of the Spirit. There's nine fruits of the Spirit, and this is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So we've, we've talked about the characteristic of, 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 of uh, the Spirit, which is called fruit, because fruit must be cultivated and it must grow. We have five fruit trees in our backyard. We had to cultivate them. We had to take care of them to watch them grow, to produce fruit. So it takes faithfulness, which is demonstrated by endurance for any kind of fruit to be, to be grown. It takes faithfulness and it takes endurance. In other words, it takes time, okay? But how is faithfulness growing? This is a question this morning. This is important for us to understand if we're going to bear fruit. How do we bear fruit in the kingdom of God? Fruit trees grow on, fruit grows on trees, not small plants. Fruit grows on trees, not small plants. A small plant may sprout up and produce vegetables for a single season. Miss Barb planted some tomatoes this year for the first time. Man, we got all kinds of tomatoes off of that, that one little, well, we had like three little vines, okay? We got a lot of fruit off of that. But fruit trees are different. It takes years for them to develop before they'll bear fruit. And this is why we're told in Hebrews 6, 12, it says, Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So it takes faith and it takes patience. Remember I told you the word for patience in the Greek is hoopamony. So you've got to have some hoopamony if you're going to receive the promise of God. Faith and patience to inherit the promises of God. One of the reasons why there's so little fruit of the Spirit in the body of Christ today is because we lack faithfulness. Faithfulness is demonstrated by endurance over time until fruit is produced. Let me say that again. Faithfulness is demonstrated by endurance over time until fruit is produced. I hear many complaints about how pastors and, and leaders tend to interpret faithfulness of how committed people are to their own vision. But listen to this. Now, this may be true, but it's not necessarily wrong. But in fact, to be faithful in someone else's vision is crucial to developing the maturity in Christians so that they too can bear fruit. So we must be, we must be faithful in helping someone else pursue and achieve their vision if the Lord's going to allow us to fulfill our vision. We have to do that. We have to do that. You know, when I got saved, we, my wife and I have been in two churches we were in one church for seven years, another church for seven years, 14 years. So we did a 14-year apprenticeship. So we helped someone else fulfill their vision, two people actually, 
And now the Lord is helping us to fulfill our vision by surrounding us with other people. Amen? So we have to help other people fulfill their vision if we're going to have a vision for ourselves. So for many years, and it's in, it's in our purpose statement. I should put that up on the screen. For many years, I've championed, championed the need for people to know their own purpose and have their own vision. But this vision, if it's real, must fit together with the corporate vision. Also, the more significant the calling that we have, the longer and more difficult the time of serving someone else's vision will usually, will usually be before he will free us to pursue our own vision. For us, it took 14 years, okay? Now, it's, it's different in everybody's case, okay? Not everybody's the same, but we have to help other people. The Bible says that if, uh, how does that verse go? If you help someone else, if you help someone else pursue what God has called them to do, then the Lord will give you your own. If you're faithful in another person's call, then the Lord will give you your own. In other words, that's what he's trying to, trying to say to us. So we have to be faithful in other people's vision. And this is because we are the branches and he is the vine. We are the branches, and he is the vine. A branch cannot bear fruit without abiding in the vine. So his life must flow through us. So the life of Jesus must flow through us. We're the branches. He is the vine. And we receive his life by grace. And we're told very plainly in James chapter 4, verse number 6, it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It takes humility to serve someone else's vision. It takes humility to serve someone else's vision. Without humility, we cannot expect his grace. Without humility, we cannot expect the grace of God. See, the greater purpose that you have, the more difficult you can expect your call to serve someone else's vision to be. Because King David was not only called to be king, but to establish the throne that the scriptures would say that the Lord Jesus would even sit on that throne. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, look what it says. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed before. Before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. Before you, your throne shall be established forever. Forever. And he's talking about King David here, okay? The greatest level of humility and faithfulness was required for King David. He was a, he was a humble man. He was a faithful man. He maintained faithful. He, he remained faithful to serve the king who not only drifted from the will of God, we're talking about Saul, he remained faithful to the king even though he drifted away from the will of God and began to oppose the Lord, killing his priests and even trying to kill David. However, David remained faithful to Saul even after he died. This is the kind of faith, faithful man that David was. He remained faithful to the king, Saul, even after he died. After Saul was out of the will of God, he was killing priests, and he tried to kill David. It's an amazing thing to see how King David rewarded those who honored Saul, Saul by recovering his body. He gave him a proper burial, but he even went further than that. It was the practice of the kings during those period of times who ascended to the throne to those who had killed. They would kill off all the offsprings. So if the king died, the next king would go and kill all the children and all the offsprings of that king so that they would not try to depose him. But David did not do that. King David did the opposite. He actually honored Saul's offspring, even allowing them to eat at an honored position at his table. David remained faithful to Saul even when Saul was unfaithful himself. But this King David became the greatest example of godly Faithfulness in Scripture. He's one of the greatest men in Scripture as far as faithfulness is concerned. 
Of course, the one who succeeds, exceeds David's faithfulness is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's even more faithful than, than David, okay? But he remained faithful to man even though all the unfaithfulness and the opposition of man. Jesus had a lot of opposition. He had a lot of unfaithful people around him. As the primary work of the Lord is doing in us is to conform us to his image. He wants us to be conformed to his image. He wants us to do the works of Jesus. He wants to conform us to his image. And we can therefore expect to be called on to remain faithful to those that are even unfaithful to us. People were unfaithful to Jesus. People are going to be unfaithful to us. How many of you know, knowing that our best friends and family were going to deny us and betray us that very night, just talking about Jesus, deserting us when we needed them most, would still desire to have one more meal with them, and he even washed their feet to demonstrate his commitment to them. He even knew that they were going to betray him. But he had one more meal with them, and he even washed their feet. Even washed their feet. If we react to those who disappoint us, or are faithful to, or are unfaithful to us, then we are still immature. So we have to treat them, no matter what people do to them, we have to treat them with, with utmost respect, just like Jesus did. Everything that the Lord allows in our life is for the purpose of conforming us to His image. And if we want to see this happen, we expect we're going to have to expect to go through some things, same things that Jesus did. People are going to betray us. People are going to be unfaithful to us. But he wants us to be created in his, his image and his, his likeness. Amen. The Apostle Paul prayed to be conformed to the image of the Lord. He prayed this in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10. It says this, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. And his prayer was answered. The Apostle Paul's prayer was answered. He died with all his unfaithful friends, having likewise scattered from him, and most of the churches that he had given life to, given his life to serving, had already gone into apostasy. They had forsaken the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul said, May I know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. He wanted to be just like Jesus, so Jesus let him be just like him. The Apostle Paul probably died wondering if he had really accomplished anything through his life of sacrifice. But true sacrifice has a power to bear fruit that actually cannot be destroyed. Paul had probably forgotten long ago the few letters that he had written while he was in prison. But because Paul lived for eternity instead of the temporal, remember I said the Apostle Paul lived for eternal things, not just temporal things, there was an eternal quality about those letters that made it impossible for them to be destroyed. The letters of the Apostle Paul were, e were eternal. They could not be destroyed. Those few letters with eternity in their hearts are probably still bearing much fruit for the eternal life of all the efforts of all, all who are in ministry today. You know, when I preach the gospel to thousands of people, I preach the gospel that Paul wrote. So he is still bearing fruit through the letters that he penned while he was still in prison because he had an eternal perspective on the inside of him, and he understood that, and it came out in his writings. And people are still preaching the gospel that the Apostle Paul wrote. But would they have remembered that Paul had not been so faithful even to the end, even to death? Probably not. See, the Apostle Paul didn't know what was going to happen after he died. But his writings are still bearing fruit in the kingdom of God today. Much fruit. We must resolve that our faithfulness will not be determined by what others do. Let me say that again. We must resolve that our faithfulness will not be determined by what others do. We must resolve to remain faithful simply because it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. God calls us to be faithful. It's the right thing to do. Even if it looks like We'll be alone. We cannot see any fruit from it. It's still the right thing to do. Remember Noah? He built the ark. He preached for 120 years, not one convert. Not one convert. But he saved humanity. Amen? He saved humanity. Of course, the ultimate test of, uh, of faithfulness would probably be, 
in our relationship to a spouse. Now listen to this. But it's not what the Lord himself is daily going through with his bride. How many of you would have liked to have heard from your fiancé on your wedding day if your fiancé would have said this? Darling, I'm going to be totally faithful to you for 364 days a year. I only want one day a year to mess around. Now, what if your, what if your fiancé said that? That would not be too good, right? Here's what the, the apostle uh, James said in James 4.4. 4. He says, adulterers and adulteress, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, that's a pretty strong language. To be friends with the world means you're an enemy with God. So we, gotta be, we, we can't be hanging around people that are not of like mind, of like faith, and of like spirit. That's what he's trying to tell us here, okay? How many of his people have been devoted themselves far more to be joined to the world and the successful in the world rather than being joined with him? A lot of people today, even believers, are so consumed with being successful in this world that they're not joined to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, is this true of us? Then we too are being unfaithful to the one in which and whom all creation deserves to be faithful to, faithful to. We need to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do and all that we say. Now, if you have a question, whether this is you or not, ask yourself this question. Here's a question we need to ask ourselves. What do we spend most of our time on and what, is the mo what gets most of our attention? Are you more focused on how to get ahead on your job or your profession, making money or acquiring the things of this world more than knowing the Lord, getting closer to him and doing his will? If so, then at the very least, you have lost your first love and you are in spiritual adultery with the world. I know there are some hard words, but it's true. It's true. This is what the word of God says, okay? Listen, it's also possible to be more devoted to our church and our ministry than to the Lord himself. Let me say that again. It's also possible to be more devoted to our church and our ministry than the Lord himself. As ministers, we are called to be the friends of the bridegroom who is helping to prepare the bride for him. But how many in ministry are really just using the bride to serve themselves and their own ambitions? We know that goes on. Isn't it the most profane of all unfaithfulness to use the bride of Christ for their own selfish gain? In this way, we not only are unfaithful to ourselves, but we're seeking to have the very bride of Christ join more to us than to him. But this we are, by this, we are committing adultery in God's own life. So we have to be committed to the things of God. Again, because one day we're going to have to stand before the Lord. See, the Lord knows our heart. Amen. You know, we can, we can, we can fool people outside, but the Lord knows our heart. He really does. Now, this is a trap that causes many in ministry to fall and may well deserve the worst judgment on that day. What husband would want his wife to be so busy serving him that she had no time for him? So busy serving him that she has no time for him. What husband would want a wife that loved her job and her house more than she loved him? This, too, is an issue with faithfulness. Many in ministry are disappointed in the lack of faithfulness of the people to our vision when we ourselves are very basically being unfaithful to the Lord and people can see it. They will ultimately be faithful to us as they can see we are faithful to him. We have to be faithful to him in order for people to be faithful to us. Jack, uh, John Deere, or Jack Deere, did this study on happiness a few years ago. And the findings of this study was very interesting. But it was quite surprising what it was. The study revealed that the amount of material possessions or the lack of them actually had no real bearing on a person's happiness. Had no real bearing on a person's happiness. Our over-devotion to materialism is a trap and a deception that is robbing us of true life. So how is it that we can be more fruitful to the vision than to the Son of God? It is a righteous thing uh, to want to provide well for our family. We all want to provide well for our family, okay? But we must guard ourselves about this becoming an idol that eclipses our devotion to the Lord. And, and when it does, the fruit will be bad for ourselves and those we are providing for. So we got to make sure that we're fruitful for the kingdom of God. Don't be so overcompensated for our family and those around us. We were all created to have fellowship with God. 
And there's nothing going, to, uh, nothing going to be anything else more interesting or fulfilling to this. God wants us to be faithful to him. The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. Peter Lord did a message on that one time. I have to preach that message sometime. Keep the main thing the main thing, okay? Now, how is it that we're, how is it that we're so easily distracted from this? Unfaithfulness. The Lord develops faithfulness in us in many ways. One primary way is by having us to devote ourselves to the vision and purposes of others. This is what true ministry is, servanthood. True ministry is servanthood. When it is, we will discover there's really nothing more fulfilling than serving the Lord and helping others succeed in their purpose. It's hard for the immature to see this, but this is actually the path that will help us to succeed in our own purpose that the Lord has given us. The Apostle Paul lamented that there were many teachers, but not many fathers. He said there's many teachers, but not many fathers. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 15, look what it says. It says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now that is true. A true father will get far, from, get far more satisfaction from seeing his children succeed than his own success. We want to see our own children succeed. Amen? This is why the true measure of an authentic New Testament ministry for the one to reproduce their ministry in others to have it succeed. We want to reproduce our ministry in others so when we die, the ministry will continue to, to go on. Amen? Now, if, if it was the nature of God to empty himself into all of his glory to a, and to lower himself to become a man and to serve the very ones who rejected him, we, are, we who were made in his image will also do this. We want, we want, we want to create people to do what we've, the Lord has called us to do. So the ministry continues to go on. So if the Lord, if the Lord required the immature to go through a time of serving someone else's vision before letting them pursue their own, then we are the true path of true ministry. And our main devotion will not be to get others to support our vision as, as much as, as being devoted to helping those entrusted to our care to prepare and to release them for their own purpose. And that's one of the reasons the Lord has us to start this church, that, people might, that we might help people fulfill the plans and purposes that God has for your life. And that's in our purpose statement. And I'll, I'll put that up on the screen maybe next Sunday. That we will help people to find the purpose and the plans that God has for your life. Not just our lives. But, you know, the vision of the house will be incorporated into your vision too. So, so if the Lord requires uh, the immature to go through a time of serving someone else's vision before letting them pursue their own, then if we are on the path of true ministry, our main devotion is to get others to support our vision as much as being devoted to helping and entrusting into our care to prepare and to release them into their own ministry. So true ministry is never just faithfulness for our own vision, but serving others. God has called us to serve others. Amen? In, that, in the Lord, that is the only way to fulfill our own vision, by serving Him and serving His people Servanthood. God called all of us to be servants. Jesus came as a servant, okay? And he wants us to be servants. True faithfulness, true faithfulness to the Lord is just as he stated in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. We need to heed this verse right here. You see it's in red, so you know it's what Jesus said. Here's what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Faithfulness is something that requires laying aside of our own self-centeredness, even fulfilling our own ministry and giving ourselves to the purpose of another. We want to help other people. To fulfill God's plans and purpose for their life. The Lord has made us, so, <clears throat> made us so that this is the only way that we can really find our true purpose and fulfillment in the Lord. There's no greater bondage than self-centeredness and no greater freedom than being a slave to the Lord. I want to be a slave to Jesus. Amen? 
That's what the Apostle Paul said. However, the truly faithful ones will remain steadfast when it becomes hard, regardless of how much time that it takes. True faithfulness will see the job through to completion. True faithfulness will see the job through to completion. Now listen to this. Every leader learns fast that it is quite easy to motivate people to start a job. But there are not many left to see the job through because it's hard work to completion. So it's easy to motivate people to start, but it's hard to motivate people to stay until the work is completed. The resurre- in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, 500 people saw Jesus when he was resurrected, right? And he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to go to the upper room and wait to be endued with power. How many went to the upper room? 120. So three-quarters of them didn't see the job through, okay? Only 25% went to the upper room. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And the Spirit of God came down on them, and they began to, they began to speak in, in, in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So only 25% went, obeyed the Lord, finished the job to completion, and every person in that upper room were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. And let me tell you, and I always tell my Catholic brethren this, Mother Mary was one of those 120. So Mother Mary spoke in tongues. So it's good enough for Mother Mary, it's good enough for you. Bless God. Go back and ask your priest, how come you don't speak in tongues? He doesn't teach you on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mother Mary was a tongue talker. Praise God. You should be doing it too. Bless God. So. See, the Lord knew this was going to happen, okay? And he, also, he often caused this thing to take longer than we would like to thin out the crowds, okay? Getting rid of the unfaithful because anything of true significance must be built with faithful people. God is looking for faithful people. This is why he requires that we not only have faith, but we also have patience to inherit the promises. It takes patience to inherit the promises of God. Everything doesn't just happen like that, okay? True Christian maturity requires that we learn faithfulness to a corporate vision, something that originated in the heart of someone else, which we may or may not be the main thing in our heart, but this is needed before we expect others to be committed to our vision. Few visions and purpose of the Lord can be accomplished by just one person. So it does require joining together with others so we can accomplish this. We need one another. I tell people, we need one another. No one is an island unto themselves. However, the basis of our faith must, uh, must be to the Lord himself above all things, keeping him in our, as our first love. This is the basis of all faithfulness. One of our primary areas that demonstrates faithfulness is in our financial giving. Now, stay with me on this, okay? Most Christians even have a knee-jerk negative reaction to this, but it is true and it is biblical. This is the reason why the Lord himself was watching the people giving at the temple. Jesus was watching people giving at the temple. Jesus being a true representative of the Father demonstrated by this that this was something that was important to the Father. As Jesus was watching him give to the temple, he knew this was something that was important to the Father. This is because where a person's treasure is, there also will his heart be. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. You know, when I was once inquiring of the Lord and, and to know who to add to the, to the staff here at the church, and he said, you know what you should do? You should look at their giving record. For where their heart is, there also shall be their, or where their treasure is, there also shall be your heart. So then I've concluded that this is probably, is truly the best barometer of a person's faithfulness. If their heart is really are with the Lord, they will put their treasures into his work. If their heart is with you and what you're doing for him, they will invest there. If they will not put their treasure there, then they're not sure that their hearts will be there either. So where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. The very thought of this will cause a strong reaction in some. But those who are the ones who will, who will count, that those are the ones you can count on because they're the ones that will demand the most and give the least. A lot of times people that demand the most will give the least. When difficulties come, the first ones that are disgruntled and, and, and the fastest to desert, to desert you, okay? It's my observation, this has been the, the true of time. Money is usually the ultimate idol in a person's life. Money can be the ultimate idol in a person's life. What we must put our trust in above the Lord. 
And where we put our treasure, this is where our hearts will be. So where our treasure is, that's where our heart's at. That's why if we're going to be true shepherds, we have a baking responsibility to teach financial faithfulness to those who he has trusted into our care. We need to teach you financial principles that will, that will help you, okay? 10% to the Lord, 10% in savings. Do what you want to do with the other 80%, bless God. So, but if you do that, if you do that, the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. That is a, that is a, that is a fact, amen? So if we start doing that as soon as we got saved, 10% of the Lord, 10% in savings, when you get ready to retire, you got all the money you need. Bless God. So, but that's a, that's a, it's a basic, that's a basic principle of, of, of the Word of God.